So, um, Cat Power is a great name, by the way. Um, well, it comes from an old engine company in America that's called Cat Diesel Power. It's, it was an engine, a diesel engine. And, um, and then Caterpillar bought the company in the 90s. So now you'll never see Cat Diesel anymore. So, sometimes you'll see the cat, but it stands for Cat Caterpillar. So nothing to do with cats? People, people power. But I didn't know that um, until I got older. So you finally made it to be on tour here in Europe. A lot of people were waiting for you last year. Um, what happened? Uh, I was uh, two days before. It's the same thing that happened when The Greatest came out. I was didn't realize I was suffering from, uh, like, they call it exhaustion when you reach a point of exhaustion. But I was, I was past that point during The Greatest thing. And so I kept trying to keep working and everything. And uh, I had a, I, w I didn't sleep for, I don't know, maybe a week or something. And all I was doing was working. And um, I had a psychotic break. You know, they say, you'll go crazy if you don't sleep because you can't process your subconscious. You can't, um, you, it starts taking, you know, your dreams start becoming a reality kind of thing. Okay. And okay. then, <clears throat> so uh, so when I got out of there on the eleventh day, and um, how did that happen? I mean, work. I don't have a manager. I still don't. And at the time, I had a just a lot of work, you know. And the psychotic break. <laughs> yeah. So I was uh, really tired and uh, really stressed out. It comes on by stress, right? And I was younger, so my physical body you know, could handle the stress, but this time, years later, after all the work, I was able-minded, right? But my body was weak, because I was older, you know, so my body broke down, and it was, uh, I had some things happen in my personal life, and I, all the work combined, something happened with my family <clears throat> that was really intense, and I had to very quickly uh, do a lot of strategy between different things to get certain things safe, And uh, I think that that was just like the, the, the cherry, you know, the few cherries right on the top. And uh, then I woke up, couldn't breathe. And, um, and um, Maya found out that all these doctors, different, whatever. I w so for this, two days after Sun came out, <clears throat> uh, I was in Beverly Hills intensive care unit for three days. And they'd bring all these, you know, doctors and people. They didn't know what was wrong with me. And then, um, you know, they had all the tubes and they told me they had to put me in a coma to save my lungs. And that's when I was made sure that I didn't want any, anything to, you know, faking like, yeah, I can breathe. You know, I can't even talk because everything's so swollen, but I'm like, you know, acting alert because I was afraid that if they put me in a coma that they would, that I might lose consciousness. I'm allergic to everything. I've always had a poor immune system since I was little. You know, so I was afraid that if anything happened to me while I was under, that they so I said my lungs for to, for me or for lungs for someone else. So that's when I was like fighting. And so I went in and out of the hospital eight times, and it was um, I had a piece of paper, I had everything written down, and I had to show it to the ambulance guy because a lot of times, because I only have a certain amount of time, and then it closes up, and then you can die or whatever. Mm. So um, <clears throat> through all the therapy, the homeopathic, you know, the Reiki and the different things that I was doing, acupuncture and all that stuff. The last time it was in Toronto and I had to cancel my tour because my life is really important to me. And I, I um, so I, um, because of what happened with the greatest and everyone thought, oh, well, she's an alcoholic mm -hmm. and she's crazy and all this other stuff. Um, don't say it's because you're sick. Did you um, at one point decide to be so open about this also? Well, or? I decided that I'd already been in fear when I was in the mental ward when I was stressed out and had the psychotic break, which was the most horrifying. I thought before, I thought I knew what horrifying was until I was in there. <clears throat> and that was the most horrifying thing I've ever experienced, being taken away from your rights um, and not, and having being a psychotic break where you don't even know your name and you don't even know who you are, where you are. You don't recognize people that you've known for 20 years. 
that psychotic break was the most horrifying thing I'd experienced at that point in my life. But then, like, 15 years later, or having many years, this so is 20, however old, it's 34. So then I'm 41, 40, 40. And then I got a tube in my throat, and there, I'm in the intensive care unit with doctors coming on different shifts saying they don't know what's wrong with me. Um, and, you know, thinking that at any minute, when I'm out of the hospital, that at any minute that I'm going to die. So then there's that. And then so overcoming that... Then I'm wondering, well, what, 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 what should I be afraid of now? To go back a little bit, um, sorry. I would love to uh, know what music you actually grew up with. Everything. A... When I lived, uh, my, my, I didn't see my mom, my mom and dad. My mom left. I think I was six months, and I never saw my dad until I met my mom and dad. I was like four. And then um, I've never told anybody that on camera or in an interview. And you're mad at me, but I'm not mad at myself. But, um, and, uh, yeah, so I grew up around my grandmother and um, singing to me. And, um, like, when she bathed me in the sink, you know, and she'd sing, like, hymns or country music or, you know, songs that were contemporary for her growing up in the South. You know, she'd sing those songs, you know. <clears throat> and then um, and then when I met my mom and dad, I would hear things in the car or we lived with a funk we lived with this band in Atlanta called Mother's Finest. Uh, a lot of DJ records, you know, at that time in the seventies, like, you know things they play at the disco, you know, so I heard all that stuff. And then I heard, you know, my dad's bands and you know there you know, the all that, you know, rock and roll and then those records you know the pre-date rock and roll where it comes from you know muddy waters everything the stone all the pre stuff you know the billy holly everything billy holly buddy holly all this stuff otis Red, you know the whole all the other stuff and uh and then when i was like 13 at the listen to the radio or 12 you know mtv came on i'm like What's what's rap? What's what's this? What's this? What's this? Because I'd already heard Sugar Hill Gang. I said a hip hop, a hip blah blah. Anyway, we loved it. Roller skating all the time. That's all I did because I was always the new kid. Every new school, I just okay wanted to go. The, I'd go to the roller skating rink by myself because that's what I do at the park when I was a little kid in my underwear. You know, my mom had an afro. Like I thought I was one of those dudes who were going around the cone. You know, in those little shorts with the eyeglasses. You know, in the tape deck or whatever and um so i love roller skating and i love you know like funk music and stuff and then i heard on the radio i heard i heard a i heard a black flag i heard um it was like a radio channel that wouldn't cut oh that band that i the first video i ever saw on mtv was uh was um the message by um you know he's saying the message you know, the message, you know, don't push me because I'm close to the Grandmaster, Grandmaster Flash. Flash. <laughs> that was the first video I ever saw. And you know where it's filmed, you know? It's filmed in these buildings that are just like, you know? And that was the first video I ever saw on MTV. So the second uh, video I saw was X, Hungry Wolf. And then I think it was Madonna was the next one. It was like wasn't like a virgin, it was the, another one. It was Lucky Star, I think. But I'd been doing this with the radio, so then it was like Black Flag, R.E.M., you know, uh, co Corrosion of Conformity, Slayer, um, Minor Threat, um, uh, you know, all that. And then, um, so then it started to, you know, so it's like music was always around, you know? And I think it's very typical of people who are, my parents were young, so typical of people who grew up in that sort of, you know, life, lifestyle, who didn't go to Berkeley or Yale, you know, parents that were around during that movement, Vietnam time. So your father also being a musician, did he support your... Um, my stepdad was also a musician. My stepdad was much more supportive, um, even though I never wanted to be a musician, but he was just, you know, in his underwear, playing like 
imagining in his mind with a sombrero on his head, imagining that he's doing like an Eric Clapton solo, which he's not, you know. But uh, my dad, no, because he was a perf he's a performer, so my stepdad wasn't, you know. Um, so that was my dad's for area. He did get me a Mr. Microphone when I was, I think, five. But um, what's a Mr. Microphone? It just looks like that, but it's a round orange thing. It has a cord that goes to you can plug it into a radio, you know. And uh, my grandmother used to record, tape record me singing when I was little. She'd make me sing all these songs for her. And um, my sister would always sing, yesterday. And then she'd sing, tomorrow. And I was always like, oh, yeah, boring. So my favorite song was The Gambler. And you got new. And I have the cassette. It's like, you got new wind, who do? No wind, fall down. No wind, walk away. No wind, run. But then when I moved to New York and shit happened and my friends were ODing and dying and HIV and all this shit and stuff. I moved to New York with a friend of mine and um, and I didn't I didn't know that I was going to be a musician. I wanted to be a baker. <laughs> a baker. I wanted to be a baker. I wanted to be a painter. I wanted to get the fuck out of the South. I'm losing my brain. I'm losing my mind. And um, there were times when it was especially hard for you to be on stage. Um, <clears throat> in the yeah, beginning. because it was different. <clears throat> Because I used to be, it used to be okay if I had my back to the audience, because that's how I would, that's, that was comfortable, right? It was comfortable, that was comfortable for me, but it's not comfortable for everybody else. So you have to do what everybody else wants. Okay, like, because <clears throat> I was like so, like, you know, as a, I was so, as I grew up, you know, the period between like, say seven and, you know, you know, tells about 27, uh, you know, even, yeah, I was very like, I was very different than I am now. I'm older now. You learn things when you're older through life experience, seeing the world, meeting people from all kinds of, <clears throat> you know, situations. Mama, you got the d d blue jean jacket. You mad at me? You want it? <clears throat> it just got chilly. Uh, but what, what drew you to, to the music and to the my stage? Friend, my friend, Glenn. I didn't have friends. I had one friend. Um, I met another friend. You know, the longer I stayed, I met more people, more friends. But he was my friend, you know? And he was like my trusted like father, brother, uncle, friend, father figure, older than me, someone I trusted, you know? And he was working at Yeshiva Law School for the director, the president of the Yeshiva Law School. Super smart, you know? Because the usual story you would always expect, uh, well, most of the time is true that somebody really wants to be on stage. And well, when you grow up with your dad, as a, um, you know, as a child as well. Well, you see, you know, I saw my dad. I wanted to be a painter, you know, I wanted to be a painter or a writer. I like. Well, I used to want to be like a war photographer, or or a uh, prima ballerina, but I never took ballet. But or or a first female conductor conductor, but now they have them. Or I wanted to like be an inventor. And, uh, or I wanted to be a um, painter or a, a crime writer, a psychological crime writer. But, um, and I just sang all the time anyway at school. I used to always go to these different schools all the time. And the best place to sing is physical education. When you change your clothes, I was so shy about my body because of other shit that I'm not going to get into. But so I'd always wait till everyone left. And then I change and relax, and I always sing because all those rooms with the showers, they're always tiled. So it has the most amazing reverb. If you ever know about me, I'm always screaming, more reverb! So now everybody can figure out why I like to hear reverb when I sing. Because it's like ominous and it really can take you away from that. Whatever. But, um, but the only people that, the only people that ever heard me were the girls coming in to, 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 to do practice or for basketball or sports or whatever, and they were always the African-American girls. They'd always bust me at every school. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, whatever school, but I, they grew an affinity for me because they would always come to expect it. And they, uh, you know, I remember at the time, one of the songs, one of the songs that I would sing, because I'd seen that movie, Spielberg movie, Color Purple. And I was a huge fan of uh, like blues and I loved Billie Holiday so much. And there's this character in that movie Suge, who sings this amazing song, and uh, 
God is trying to tell you something and uh, sister and all that stuff. So during that period, I remember they would come and ask me to sing for them. That was really fun. So that was probably the first time I've performed. But It always seems like when you're talking and also when you when sometimes when you're singing and all, sometimes it's a, even if it's not a real whisper, it seems like you're whispering. Um, and seems like you're re reliving moments all the time. Is that something well, you... Well, reality. I don't like fabrication. I think there's one song that I made up called Water and Air, but maybe that's from a past life. But uh, I, I'm the kind of person that I love a beat, I love a beat, I love a beat, I love a beat. And I like goofy, si silly lyrics if the melody is catchy or something, you know? But I don't like listening to a song over and over and over and over unless it penetrates something deeper than my intellect you know or something deeper than my groove body you know and that's why I, you know what I mean it's like music is like the translator the great translate you know can you can meet a stranger and a war is going to happen but maybe you know that's Um, the time you finished Sun, you separated from your boyfriend. Yeah, it was three. Uh, I had, um, I had, uh, I had to go mix the final versions. I had two weeks. I had three weeks. Two weeks again. Three weeks. Sorry. I had three weeks again, just like the last time. And I, I remember I laid on the couch for about three days. I would get up to pee. And I was just like comatose, like in a half sleep state, three days. I had no energy. It felt like I like, had gotten severely beaten up. Like I felt like I was, <clears throat> I felt like I had no soul. I felt empty, like a empty, em something empty. Hello, I can hear you. And um, you hear them, they're like a little something come closer. She nodded her head yes, by the way. And, um, Is it a kitty cat? Actually, it was Paris, was the first journalist who said, so this record's about your breakup. And I wanted to punch him in his face. No, it's not. That's what I meant, it seems. No, it's not. Uh -huh. How could I narrow myself down to be so so small to that my life would revolve and that my whole being would... Yeah, I'm not. I'm not that small. Can we just really quickly mention that um, the concentration camps that Dick Cheney in 1997, the U.S. Yeah, Congress... Maybe we'll stop that and then see if it's rolling. Let me know what is really important to you. Yeah, well, today, uh, the past week, uh, past five, four days, five days, <clears throat> it's on my Instagram and I've been tweeting about it, but... Nobody wants to talk about it. Everybody I've met from airports to hotels to uh, taxi drivers to friends, nobody knows what I'm talking about, hasn't heard about it, except my friends in, it was started with Istanbul, except my friends in Istanbul, um, which led me to discover my friend, uh, journalist, Bill Van Meter, William Van Meter, journalist from New York, sent me the link about Greece, how their law, uh, have concentration camps currently in Greece, uh, locking up people or sending them on trains, and they're using that word. I'm not using that word, concentration camp. They are, and because I had free, I mean, because I paid for the Wi-Fi on the plane, I found, um, let me put it on Instagram. Whenever I put that on Instagram, I get maybe 60 likes. When I put a picture of my face, I get maybe 800 likes. So I've been searching for more, learning about, learning about, The ones in um, America, 800, 2011, FEMA confirmed that there are 800 concentration camps that Dick Cheney's company, Halliburton, have in America, in the United States. There's one in Glendale. Um, <clears throat> again, that have seen them or yeah, you can look, you can search, and it's you can find it. And that's what I keep saying on the Twitter and everything, and people don't want to know. So then I started digging, and today I found U.S. Congress passed in 1997 um, confirmation for the contract to go through uh, um, 
for them to begin building the facilities, the internment camps. Yeah, what, they, what do they call them, internment camps? Well, on though? paper, they got to make up some special word for 9-11. Terrorist, terrorist, terrorist. But you can look on the Internet and you'll find it.